Two men in club t-shirts were heaving furniture into a van. A gate into the ground behind them was open. Excuse me, I said, possibly in the voice of a child asking to see Santa. Can I go in? Without looking up, the older of the two replied, Aye, if you're careful. This magic house unfurled before me. I stood first behind the goal in the Longhurst stand, recalling aloft arms and kids stretching on tiptoes to see the action on long-gone glory nights. Pigeons cooed rowdily and the grass was long and unkempt, but it remained possible to trick ears into hearing the sounds of yesterday and to look to the pitch and see bygone happenings or at the columns of crush barriers around me and rekindle faces from a quarter of a century ago. At the back of the stand, the snack bar shutter was bolted forever, its meal deal signs intact. Moss advanced up breeze block walls like storm clouds on a television weather map, and I began to wonder if seeing, and in future recalling, the dear old place in this state was such a good idea. Here I was though, and only in this instant could I snoop inside the decomposing wooden hut, where supporters would pay one pound to transfer to the seats of the popular stand. I continued on and into the pop, with its alphabet steps denoting rows now gagged and smothered by dandelions and other trespassing weeds. I looked across to the main stand, now robbed barren and flashing a boxer's tooth-scarce grin. Back by the pitch, a blackbird pecked at the cleft which once hosted a corner flag's pole, and a thousand stud marks remained, the fossils of linesmen and substitutes. For a while, I rested on a crush bar in the away end, looking out and wondering how many thousands of people down the years had called this place home. Now, the clocks had stopped and I was standing in a memory. I walked along the fading touchline, reached the corner and had one last look around. Outside, the older man asked, You all done, son? I said I was, but he probably knew that much by the tears in my eyes.